Good morning, church family. Please turn with me in your copy of God's Word to the book of Isaiah, chapter 49. Isaiah 49, it's page 724 in your pew Bible. While you're turning there, I just uh, I want to say I'm glad to see you all made it here because of course today begins daylight savings time. And for all the frustrations and the difficulties that modern technology can bring, I personally am very grateful for the technology that makes my phone change the clock automatically so I don't have to worry about it anymore because there have been times in the past where I have forgotten, and especially on a Sunday, it made for a hectic and panicked Sunday morning, and thankfully that was before I entered the ministry, so I haven't had to deal with that since then. Praise the Lord. But that time change, of course, that means that spring is almost here. I actually saw a couple more signs this week that spring is almost here. Besides the time change, I heard there's a, there's a bird who's made a nest in the little downspout on my house, and they're chirping early in the morning. The other day, I was out in the backyard. I had to swat a mosquito on my arm. We have the beautiful daffodils out front here. I love those. Um, most important sign of spring, though, is that I saw Carrie and Kevin mowing the grass this week. So I'm thankful, Carrie and Kevin, wherever you are, for all the, all the things that you constantly do for this church and this, our lovely building and grounds. So thank you. We're continuing our Lenten series, and really we started it back during Advent series, looking at Christ in Isaiah. And last week we began looking at the first of the four passages that we call the servant songs in Isaiah. These are four passages that foreshadow and foretell how the Messiah will be not only the conquering king who will save his people from their enemies, but he will also be the suffering servant who will save his people not only from their earthly enemies, but from their truest and most deepest need. And that is, of course, sin. And in the course of these four servant songs, the prophet is revealing different uh, facets, different aspects of the person, the life, the ministry, the identity of the servant. Who will he be? What will he do? And so last week from Isaiah 42, we saw a glimpse into the servant's mission. He will be the ideal servant of the Lord. He will be perfect in every way. He's the one who is going to bring God's perfect justice. He's perfectly going to glorify God in every way. And he's going to be the new covenant, not just the head or the mediator of the covenant, but more than that, he himself will be the covenant embodied covenant because he's going to fulfill God's promises not just to David or Moses or Abraham but all the way back to Adam remember we said he's the recapitulation of creation he's bringing God's covenantal blessings not just to ethnic Israel but to the entire world and so we're going to be seeing a lot of those same themes this morning now that we have uh, some idea of the servant's mission the prophet is now going to give us a glimpse into the servant's calling the servant's calling, both in the sense of the servant being called by God for a specific task, a specific purpose, but also calling in the sense of actually carrying out the task. And what are some of the results of his task? What is the servant's calling? So I hope you've turned there by now. We're going to read Isaiah chapter 49, beginning in verse 1, and read through verse 13. The prophet Isaiah, under the inspiration of God the Holy Spirit, writes these words. Listen to me, O coastlands, and give attention, you peoples from afar. The Lord called me from the womb, from the body of my mother he named my name. He made my mouth like a sharp sword. In the shadow of his hand he hid me. He made me a polished arrow. In his quiver he hid me away. And he said to me, You are my servant, Israel, in whom I will be glorified. But I said, I have labored in vain. I have spent my strength for nothing and vanity. Yet surely my right is with the Lord, and my recompense with my God. And now the Lord says, He who formed me from the womb to be his servant, to bring Jacob back to him, and that Israel might be gathered to him, for I am honored in the eyes of the Lord, and my God has become my strength. He says, It is too light a thing that you should be my servant, to raise up the tribes of Jacob, and to bring back the preserved of Israel. I will make you as a light for the nations." that my salvation may reach to the end of the earth. Thus says the Lord, the Redeemer of Israel and His Holy One, to one deeply despised, abhorred by the nation, the servant of rulers. Kings shall see and arise, princes, and they shall prostrate themselves because of the Lord who is faithful, the Holy One of Israel who has chosen you. Thus says the Lord, in a time of favor I have answered you. In a day of salvation I have helped you. 
I will keep you and give you as a covenant to the people to establish the land, to apportion the desolate heritages, saying to the prisoners, Come out, to those who are in darkness, appear. They shall feed along the ways. On all bare heights shall be their pasture. They shall not hunger nor thirst. Neither scorching wind nor sun shall strike them. For he who has pity on them will lead them. And by, strings, by springs of water he will guide them. And I will make all my mountains a road, and my highways shall be raised up. Behold, these shall come from afar, and behold, these from the north and from the west, and those from the land of Syene. Sing for joy, O heavens, and exult, O earth. Break forth, O mountains, into singing, for the Lord has comforted his people, and he will have compassion on his afflicted. Living God, I pray that you would help us to hear your holy word, that, may we, that we may truly understand, and that understanding we may believe it, and in believing we may follow you in faithfulness and in obedience, and seek your honor and your glory in all that we do. Through Jesus Christ our Lord, we pray. Amen. So like I mentioned last week, there is still to this day a lot of debate among different groups and different religions and different traditions about who is the servant in these four songs. The Jewish people today, by and large, claim that the servant is representative of the nation of ethnic Israel. But again, bottom line up front, spoiler alert, it's not about Israel, it's about Jesus. Jesus is the servant. We call him the true and better Israel. We call him the true Israel of God, Jesus Christ. We'll talk a little bit more about that in just a moment. So keep that in your mind as we move through this passage. Ask God to give you the eyes to see Jesus Christ in these words. Then see the perfect suffering servant of the Lord. So in this passage, we're talking about the servant's calling. We see two broad sections. And it's in the first section that we're going to spend the bulk of our time this morning. That first section is in verses 1 through 6. And so this first section, verses 1 through 6, we see the servant's commission. The servant's commission. This is dealing with God issuing his call. God giving his commission, delivering his charge to ministry to the servant. And here again, we're going to break this section into two smaller sections. So first, how did God call his servant? We're not talking about in the uh, recounting the narrative sense, like when Isaiah got his call, and of course we, in, in chapter 6 he was swept up into the throne room of God, and he describes that experience. We're not talking in that sense, but what was, how did God call his servant in the sense, what is the character, what is the nature of God's call to his servant, to his ideal and perfect servant? So we see three aspects here, three aspects of the character of the servant's calling. First, God called his servant specifically. He called his servant specifically. Verse 1, Listen to me, O coastlands. Give attention, you peoples from afar. This is the, the task that the servant is going to be called to do. God has called him to do it in the sight of the entire world. It's going to be on display for all the nations to see. Now, just before this passage, at the end of chapter 48, verse 20, God said to his people, remember the prophets writing in the future, to people in exile in Babylon, and God said, go out from Babylon, <laughs> flee from Chaldea, declare this with a shout of joy, proclaim it, send it out to the end of the earth. And the message that the Jewish people upon their return from exile was to say, the Lord has redeemed his servant Jacob. God is getting ready to do mighty deeds in and through his people Israel. God is going to bring his people back to the land, out of exile in Babylon. But even that glorious event was still not the final goal, was it? The people are still supposed to announce to the entire world that God saves, that God brings his people, God will redeem his people. And so then God is saying, listen up, all nations, pay attention, all you other peoples of the earth, I'm about to call my servant. My perfect servant, remember from Isaiah 42, the one in whom my soul delights, the one who is going to fulfill my covenantal requirements, the one who is going to remove the covenantal curses, the one who is going to bring all my people into the fold of my, my people and bring them into my covenantal blessings. Listen up, world, it's going to happen. So what's the first part of this call? The second part of verse 1. The Lord called me from the womb. This is the servant speaking. The Lord called me from the womb, from the body of my mother. He named my name. Now, this is another little piece of evidence here that the, the servant in view is not a nation, but rather an individual. This is the language that God uses to call his prophets, Jeremiah and others 
Scripture sometimes does refer to the nation of Israel as God's son, yes, but nowhere in Scripture is the nation of Israel referred to, even metaphorically, as having a mother. In fact, in the book of Hosea, and then Paul says it again in the book of Romans, Israel is actually spoken of as being adopted, as being like an abandoned infant on the side of the road that God the loving Father took and nurtured. The servant, though, will be an individual, a human being, a man born of a woman and set apart for perfect service to God and given a name before his birth. God called his servant specifically. The second aspect of the character of the calling, God called his servant strategically. Strategically. Verse 2. He made my mouth like a sharp sword. In the shadow of his hand he hid me. He made me a polished arrow. In his quiver he hid me away. Now, we talked last week as well about how in chapter 45, the king of Persia, Cyrus, was called a Messiah, a servant of the Lord, because God used him to bring the people back to the land out of exile. But Cyrus was a ruler. He was a tyrant. He was a military conqueror. And so in contrast to him, the servant's sword is not a sword literally, but rather his mouth, his lips, his speech. He's going to wield this weapon with exquisite precision. He's not a blunt instrument. He'll be like a polished arrow, a weapon of precision that is perfectly hold, honed and ready to be sent to its intended destination and strike where the aim is. Now, God did not send Jesus into the world during Isaiah's time, did he? Or even during the time of the return from exile? Or a little bit later, as Alexander the Great swept through the world and made the whole world Hellenized? Or even after that, as Alexander died and then his empire faded and crumbled? None of those times were the right time. But when did Jesus come? Galatians tells us that he came in the fullness of time. God kept his servant hidden until exactly the right time in human history. When he did come, God protected him. God upheld him even through uh, uh, conspiracies and, and, and plots to kill him. And that one time at the beginning of his ministry when his own talented people tried to throw him off a cliff, <laughs> God protected him until the time had come, until his earthly task was complete and the time for his crucifixion had come. And all along the way, with everyone that Jesus met and interacted with, both his friends and his enemies, his words, his words always cut straight to the heart of the matter cut through their sin, cut through their excuses, their self-righteousness in the case of the Pharisees and others, their hatred of him. His words always exposed the true state of their souls. God called his servant strategically. The third thing we see is that God called his servant substitutionally. Substitutionally, verse 3. He said to me, you are my servant, Israel, in whom I will be glorified. But wait a minute, I thought we just said that the servant was not the nation of Israel. He's not. God is uh, still talking to his individual human servant here, this individual which is distinct from the nation of ethnic Israel. Remember, Israel can't save themselves. Israel needs a savior. And wait, I thought his name was, his given name was Jesus, not Israel. How can this be referring to Jesus? This is a loaded concept, beloved. We started to unpack it just a little bit last week. We're going to look at it some more right now, and we're going to continue to come back to it through the rest of this mini-series in Isaiah, and then again when we go back to the Gospel of Matthew after that. But Jesus is the true and better Israel. Jesus is the true Israel of God. Now, the nation of Israel, ethnic Israel, they were chosen by God, yes. They were adopted as his son in that sense. They were called to be his servant. They were set apart for service to him. They were called to be holy and separate and sanctified. They were called to be a royal priesthood, a light to the nations, to shine the light of God's covenantal blessings to uh, what in the Greek says, panta ta ethne, all the ethnicities, all the nations, the peoples of the world. But of course, they failed in that mission, didn't they? They rebelled. They rejected God. They became inwardly focused. And all throughout Scripture, all throughout the Old Testament, we see these just these seeds, seeds and hints that, of hope that there would be a new Israel, one who would succeed in the mission that they were supposed to do. 
one who would succeed where they had failed, and so in so doing to remove them from under the curse and restore them to the blessing of God's covenantal relationship. The nation of Israel needed a substitution. A substitution. Now this is kind of uh, introduction to covenant theology 101 right here. And you'll often hear uh, people who don't agree with covenant theology. They refer to this uh, derisively as supersessionist theology or, or replacement theology. You think the church is replacing Israel. Beloved, no. That's not what we're saying here. That's not what we believe. Nothing could be further from the truth. Jesus Christ was always intended to be the Messiah in what we call the pactum salutis, the agreement before creation that the Father, Son, and Spirit made to have Jesus Christ come into the world in the fullness of time. Jesus was always going to come. The cross of Jesus Christ was always plan A. It's not plan B or anything else. And so what, he didn't come to be, to be a replacement. Jesus came to be the true Israel of God as a substitute, vicariously representing all his people, both in his righteous life and in his sacrificial atoning death, and so to make all of his people into one holy nation, the true Israel of God, all who are united to Jesus Christ by faith, Jew and Gentile, male and female, slave or free, past, present, and future. The true Israel of God is all who are united to the true Israel of God by grace alone, through faith alone. And so Jesus is the true Israel of God, the true and better Israel. He is the substitution, not in the sense of a replacement, but in the sense of a representative. A representative. Because Israel, and all of us today, of every ethnicity, we need a substitute. We need someone to stand in our place and fulfill our obligations to God on our behalf because we can't do it. And that's exactly what Jesus came to do. In his death on the cross, yes, but more than that, in his entire life of perfect obedience to the Father, which made him worthy then to be our substitute in his atoning death on the cross. He's the true and better Israel. We see this all throughout the New Testament, and especially in the Gospel of Matthew. It's a big place for it. Remember, in the Old Testament, God brought his people out of Egypt, right? He, he, uh, he uh, led them through the waters of the Red Sea. And after that, they were out in the wilderness. They were formed into a nation and given the law, but in the wilderness, they rebelled against God. And so they failed to enter the rest of the promised land, right? They had to wander for 40 more years. And so then Jesus comes along, the true Israel of God, and what happens? As an infant, he's driven down to Egypt, and then he comes back up out of Egypt. At the beginning of his ministry, he goes through the waters as he's baptized by John the Baptist. And immediately afterward, in both Matthew and in Luke, he's driven into the wilderness where he's tested by God for 40 days. And where Israel failed, then Jesus succeeded. He passed the test that Israel had failed because he is Emmanuel, God with us, God and man perfectly united in one person. And so then because Jesus succeeded in fulfilling Israel's obligation of serving God perfectly, Jesus was therefore worthy and able to serve as the substitute for all of his people. He fulfilled the law. He took the curse of suffering and death upon himself in order to satisfy the Father's wrath of all the sins of all of his people. He secured for himself all of God's promised covenantal blessings. And then, in his love and his grace, he extends those covenantal blessings, that relationship with God the Father, to all who are his by faith, Jew and Gentile alike, all who are adopted into his family by grace alone, through faith alone. Beloved, hallelujah. What a Savior we have. This is who Jesus is. Jesus is God's servant, Israel, in whom God the Father will be glorified. Jesus is the true and better Israel. Jesus is the true Israel of God. God called his servant substitutionally. So now we've seen the character of God's call. And in the next three verses, we see the results of the servant's work. We pick it up in verse 4. But I said, I have labored in vain. I have spent my strength for nothing and vanity. The first result of the servant's work that we see is evident failure. 
self-evident failure. Now, how could anyone say that? How could the servant himself paint such a bleak picture of the results of his work? How could Jesus view his own life and ministry as a failure? Well, from strictly an earthly perspective, at the time of his crucifixion, it was a failure, wasn't it? From a strictly human standpoint, Jesus' life at that time seemed to be a complete waste. Here was this hugely popular teacher, this leader of of men who had spent three and a half years going around the country, uh, performing miraculous signs and wonders, gathering a significant following in every region of the land. He seemed to be poised to many people to be the one to finally deliver on God's promises to free his people from oppression, the one who would finally usher in that golden age of peace and prosperity. And in less than one week, he went from the most popular person in Jerusalem to the most hated person in the city. As the Jewish leaders there incited the crowds against him, as he failed to deliver on their promises to overthrow the Roman Empire. The Jewish leaders convinced the Romans then to have him publicly executed in the most humiliating and quite literally excruciating way imaginable. They mocked him as he hung there. He saved others. Let's see if he could save himself. And even though Jesus knew that he had to do this, that he had to endure the cross in order to accomplish his mission, the salvation of his people, there was still that moment, wasn't there? There were still those three hours as he hung on that cross when the darkness, the entire world was darkened as the veil of separation came between the Father and the Son and Jesus cried out, My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? At that moment, the initial and earthly result of of the servant's work was evident failure. But of course, it didn't stay there. The second result we see is divine purpose divine purpose the second part of verse four yet surely my right is with the lord and my recompense with my god as he hung there on the cross jesus had the most perfect faith you could possibly imagine the most perfect courage and the most perfect dedication any human being has ever had to trust god and obey him through those three hours of separation and that word recompense in the hebrew it's the same word we talked about last week mishpat Remember, that can be translated as justice and is often translated as justice or judgment or righteousness. God the Father had observed Jesus' perfect life. His life of perfect submission, perfect obedience, perfect service, perfect fulfillment of the law. Remember what Abraham said back in Genesis. He said, God is the righteous judge of all the universe and He will do what is right. And so it would be sinful of God to fail to give Jesus justice, mishpat, recompense. It would be wrong of God to fail to give Jesus what he had earned, what he had merited. Now, Israel had merited what? God's curses, right? Exile. But the second Israel had merited, had earned only God's covenantal blessings. And so in that moment, during those three hours of separation, God, as Jesus took God's wrath, Jesus had to rely on God's covenantal promises in a way that our non-divine minds, our finite, merely human minds, can barely begin to understand. And by the way, beloved, this is why we can trust Jesus to help us in our own times of struggle. In those times when we have to walk by faith and not by sight, because Jesus already did this in a far greater and far more terrible way than anything we will face in this life. Our great high priest is infinitely able to sympathize with us in our trials and in our weaknesses. He is able to save to the uttermost, and he has promised to always be with us. So what justice then, what mishpat, what recompense did Jesus earn before he tells us here in this passage, he's going to remind us and remind himself, in a sense, of his divine purpose. Verse 5, And now the Lord says, He who formed me from the womb to be his servant, to bring Jacob back to him, that Israel might be gathered to him. For I am honored in the eyes of the Lord, and my God has become my strength. Even in that separation, God was still Jesus' strength. And by the way, here's another indicator, isn't there, that the servant is not the nation of Israel because the mission and the, 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 the calling of the true Israel of God, his goal is to bring Israel back to God, to bring Jacob back, to gather Israel to him. 
the true Israel of God, the true servant of the Lord, his calling is to fulfill ethnic Israel's obligations. And so, as we said last week, and enable them to serve the Lord. So what does the Lord then declare as the recompense, the justice, the mishpat earned, justly merited by his perfect servant? Verse 6. He says, it is too light a thing that you should be my servant to raise up the tribes of Jacob and to bring back the preserved of Israel. I will make you as a light for the nations that my salvation may reach to the end of the earth. The third result of the servant's work is covenantal expansion. Covenantal expansion. Oh, God is basically saying, okay, you want Jesus, you want your perfect life, your substitutionary perfect life, and your atoning death. You want that to accomplish the salvation of my people from among the ethnic Jews? Well, they are originally my covenantal people overall. Is that what you want? Fine. Done. That's too easy. It's too light a thing. Servant, he says, God says, I'm going to give you that. Yes, but I'm going to give you what you have really and truly earned. And that is the nations. The goyim. Panta ta ethne. All the ethnicities. The Gentiles. This salvation, God is saying to his servant, this salvation that you have justly and truly earned and merited and achieved, this is not only going to apply from all of my people among the Jews who are united to me to you by faith, but to my people from every tribe and every nation and every tongue, people from every ethnicity to the end of the earth, because my servant, you have earned it. You feel the glory of that, beloved. That's what God the Father declared to His beloved Son after the crucifixion. And how did He declare it to the world? By raising Him from the dead. The resurrection of Jesus was the Father's declaration that the substitution was accepted. The sacrifice was sufficient. The covenantal terms had been satisfied. The curse had been lifted. The blessing had been secured. And then Paul tells us in 1 Corinthians chapter 15 that Jesus Himself is the first fruits of what all of us shall be. People from every ethnicity who are united to the true Israel of God by grace alone, through faith alone. Now I called this point covenantal expansion, but really that's not quite accurate, is it? Some of you theologians among you have probably been thinking that already. Because Jesus did indeed fulfill God's covenant with David and with Moses and with Abraham. God's covenant, again, was always intended to apply to more than merely the ethnic Jews. Jesus is the seed of Abraham, Galatians tells us. His offspring in whom all the nations of the world will be blessed. And so not only did Jesus fulfill that covenant with Abraham, but it goes all the way back to God's original covenant with Adam, the federal head of all humanity. If you obey God perfectly, He will live. And so Jesus is the true and better Israel. He is also the true and better Adam. Psalm 2, the psalmist speaking prophetically from the point of view of the servant, the king, says, The Lord, Yahweh, God's covenantal name, said to me, You are my son. Today I have begotten you. Ask of me and I will make the nations, the goyim, the Gentiles, the ethne. Ask of me and I will make them your heritage and the ends of the earth your possession. It's all His, beloved. It's all Jesus's. The covenant was always intended to be extended to all of humanity. Paul even tells us in Romans 8 that it involves all of creation. The new covenant in the blood of Jesus Christ accomplished the salvation of all of God's people. And one day, we will live with Him in His promised land. The new heavens and the new earth. The result of the servant's work is covenantal expansion so we've seen the servant's commission both in terms of the character of his call and the result of his work and then in the second part of this passage we're going to move much more quickly through this section verses 7 through 16 we see the lord's confirmation the lord's confirmation 
Again, we today, we have the light of the rest of Scripture. We have the indwelling of the Holy Spirit. We know that Jesus' resurrection was the ultimate confirmation of God's acceptance of His work. But it isn't necessarily explicit here in the book of Isaiah. So the prophet gives us a few hints, again, a few shadows in which the servant's work will be confirmed by God. So just very quickly, five ways that we see here. First, the servant's kingship. The servant's kingship. First part of verse, of, uh, verse 7. Thus says the Lord, the Redeemer of Israel and His Holy One. By the way, those are three ways of referring to God's covenantal relationship with His people. The Lord, and we see it in all caps, remember, it's Yahweh, the name that by which God revealed to Himself to Moses at the burning bush. He's the Redeemer of Israel, the one who brings them back into a covenantal relationship. And again, He's the Holy One of Israel. That's that title used over and over again in Isaiah. So, who is He speaking to here? Thus says the Lord, to whom? To one deeply despised, abhorred by the nation, the servant of rulers. We're going to talk more about this in the next couple of weeks. The servant is the lowest of the low. We're going to look more closely at his suffering uh, in two weeks when we get to Palm Sunday. What then does the covenant God say to this lowly and suffering servant? He says, kings shall see and arise, princes, and they shall prostrate themselves because of the Lord who is faithful, the Holy One of Israel who has chosen you. In other words, the rulers of the entire earth shall come and bow down before the servant. The servant shall be high and lifted up. The accomplishment of his mission will make him worthy to be the ruler over all nations. And all of this will take place because Yahweh, the covenant-keeping Holy One of Israel, is faithful. He will fulfill his covenant through his servant. The servant will then become the conquering king. The second thing we see is the covenant's embodiment. The covenant's embodiment, verse 8. Thus says the Lord, in a time of favor I have answered you. In a day of salvation I have helped you. I will keep you and give you as a covenant to the people. We talked about this last week. Here it is again. The servant through his perfect obedience, God's vindication of his obedience, he himself will be the covenant for God's people, kept and upheld by the power of God Himself. The third thing we see here is the promises fulfillment. The promises fulfillment. The second part of verse 8. He will give them as a covenant for the people to do what? To establish the land, to apportion the desolate heritages, saying to the prisoners, come out, to those who are in darkness, appear. Now these are just a few lines. They only hint at the fullness of God's covenantal promises, God's covenantal blessings. The promise of land, of course, that's a massive theme in Scripture. We don't have nearly the time to address that this morning. But in, in a nutshell, not only will the Jews return to their homeland, but their temporary possession of that particular region of the earth, that itself is a type and a shadow of the greater reality that is yet to come. Do you remember what Jesus said in His Sermon on the Mount? Blessed are the meek, for they shall inherit the earth. All God's people who have received sight out of darkness, all God's people who have received freedom from the prison of sin, one day they will finally enter into that rest, the rest of the promised land, when Christ comes back and ushers in the new heavens and the new earth. The fourth thing we see here is the people's security. The people's security. Second part of verse 9. They shall feed along the ways. On all bare heights shall be their pasture. They shall not hunger or thirst. Neither scorching wind nor sun shall strike them. For he who has pity on them will lead them. And by springs of water will guide them. I will make all my mountains a road. All my highways shall be lifted up. This is the picture of the people living in peace, living in prosperity, living in security without fear of natural disasters, without fear of famine, without fear of violent beasts or evildoers uh, who are living in the wilderness, robbers in the highways, the dangerous places in the world. No, they won't have to fear those anymore because God will have pity on His people. He will do everything that is necessary to make them dwell in the land and safety and glorious and supernatural prosperity. 
And from where shall his people come then? From among the land of Israel only? No. Verse 12. Behold, these shall come from afar. Afar refers to the east, the seemingly unending landmass that is Asia. Behold, these from the north and from the west. That refers to the, the northward from Israel to the lands of, of Europe and west to the Mediterranean Sea. And these from the land of Syene. That's to the south of geographical Israel. The Middle Eastern deserts and the lands of Africa. In other words, God is saying He's going to gather His people to Himself from every single place in the world. And then what will be the appropriate response to God? for these mighty deeds that He will accomplish through His servant. The fifth thing we see is the cosmos' worship. The cosmos' worship. Verse 13. Sing for joy, O heavens, and exult, O earth. Break forth, O mountains, into singing. Why? For the Lord has comforted His people, and He will have compassion on His afflicted. Now, Scripture often uses this imagery of creation bursting forth in praise and worship to their Creator for who He is and what He has done. Remember, Jesus Himself on that Palm Sunday said that if the people kept silent, what would happen? The very rocks themselves would spring forth in praise, right? And again, Paul tells us in Romans chapter 8 that not only we who are God's people longing for His return to get rid of sin, but He says all of creation is groaning under the burden of sin, longing for that day when God's glory will finally be revealed and that final stain of the curse will be lifted once and for all. And the reason, the reason that all creation will burst forth in praise and worship to God is because of what God has done for His people in comforting them in sending His Son, His servant, Jesus the Messiah, the Christ, to be their Savior, to be their Redeemer, their atonement. And He did this out of the infinite greatness greatness of His love, His mercy, His compassion for us. If that's not worth praising God, beloved, I don't know what it is. Jesus is God's comfort. He is God's compassion. He is God's covenant. Paul said in Galatians chapter 4, again, when the fullness of time had come, God sent forth His Son, born of a woman, born under the law, to redeem those who were under the law so that we might receive adoption as sons. And because you are sons, He said, God has sent His Spirit, the Spirit of His Son Jesus, into our hearts so we can cry out, Abba, Father! And we are no longer slaves to sin, but we are sons of God. And if we are a son, then we are heirs of his infinite riches through his son, Jesus Christ. Do you remember the name? Of course you do. The name of the son. The name given to the servant. The one that the Lord called from his mother's womb and gave him a name before his birth. Of course you know his name is Jesus. It's Yeshua. Yeshua means Yahweh is salvation. Yahweh, the covenant-keeping, the covenant-making and the covenant-keeping God not only acts and enacts and achieves salvation, He Himself is salvation. Beloved, the cross of Jesus Christ is the supreme demonstration. It is the ultimate manifestation of God's compassion and His love for His people because He loved us so much. He loved it with such an infinitely great love that even while we were His enemies, while we were dead in our trespasses and sins, while we were justly condemned under the curse of the law, no hope of fulfilling His covenant on our own, He sent His Son, His perfect servant, into the world to fulfill the covenant to be the covenant in His body and His blood on the cross, to redeem His people from the curse, to suffer and die and rise again to bring them back into that blessing of the covenantal relationship with our Creator, to extend His light to the nations, 
And as he said in verse 6, to extend his covenantal blessings, his salvation, and the Hebrew word for his salvation there is Yeshua. Yeshua. His salvation will go and be extended to the very ends of the earth. God's salvation, God's covenantal blessings for all his people is found by faith alone in his perfect servant alone. For there is no other name under heaven given among men by which we must be saved. The only name is Jesus. Jesus Christ alone. So trust in him today. Let's pray. Father, I thank you. Thank you for doing for us what we could not do for ourselves. Thank you for sending your son, Jesus, your perfect servant, to fulfill the righteous demands of your law on our behalf on behalf of all your people. Thank you that he willingly went to the cross. He willingly laid down his life as the perfect sacrifice and the substitute for the sins of his people. We thank you that you are good and you are just and righteous and that you accepted his perfect sacrifice. And you proved to the world that the price had been paid, that the debt had been settled by raising him from the dead. We thank you that all we have to do now to receive the promise of your blessing is simply place our faith in him. And when we do, we are brought back into the right relationship with you, the one thing we need above all else. We look forward to the day when he will return in his power and his glory, the day when every eye will see him, when every tongue will confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father, to the day when he will bring his people into the promised land of his eternal Sabbath rest forever. We pray these things in Jesus' name for the sake of his glorious kingdom. Amen.